Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about The Matrix Revolutions, written and directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski. I am joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everybody. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetas. Hi. So here we are at the third chapter in our Matrix, uh, month of Matrix series. Uh, So we've done one and two, now we're on three in preparation for four. So episode four, as a reminder, will be on Matrix Resurrections. We're going to see it opening night and then go and record it the next day and hopefully get it out to patrons as quickly as possible after that. So uh, yeah, look for that. it's when is it this is coming out the 17th so it's next friday so a week from when you're hearing me there should be a matrix resurrections episode so head to our patreon to make sure you don't miss that and we're going to talk about our feelings and anticipations about resurrections at the end of this episode uh but first we're going to talk about the matrix revolutions (laughs) so I think actually to, to start talking about revolutions, I I think we need to talk about the last like two minutes of The Matrix Reloaded, which yeah. I always kind of forget, but are sort of like, oh, and there's another movie coming. There's more story. Don't worry. Here, watch this. And then it kind of abruptly ends with an upside down of a person you cannot recognize. Uh, but it leaves all these weird <laughs> questions in your mind of like, you know, Neo is not in the Matrix, but he stops the machines. How is that possible? Mm. And like, who is this person? The Agent Smith has somehow gotten into the real world. What's that going to do and stuff? Uh, and then you have to wait seven months, six months, whatever it is, uh, because Reloaded came out in May and Revolutions came out in November. And I just remember going into Revolutions kind of exhausted and almost like I was like an obligatory attendance thing. Not that I didn't really enjoy Reloaded, but like I didn't have a great feeling about revolutions. And I was very confused by those final moments of Reloaded. So I didn't even really know what I was going into the theater for, except there's going to be a battle for Zion. And and there is, and we will talk about it. <laughs> um, But just, yeah, I remember going into Revolutions feeling really disoriented, uh, which is not how I went into Reloaded. I was so hyped. I was so excited. And then Revolutions, I was like, well, I'm here for it. And I like rain. There's been a lot of rain in the trailers. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that. But otherwise, I don't know how I'm feeling. So, yeah, I'm curious for you, like, Trisha, what, what were you like going into Revolutions? Were you still like, Matrix, I'm enjoying it. How were you feeling? Hell yes. I I was uh, beyond pumped. Um, Again, did not think (laughs) critically about Reloaded then or since then even really very much. Um, And was just super excited. My birthday is at the end of November. I was still 16 years old. So I still (laughs) had to have a parent with me. Although seven months had elapsed. I was not yet old enough to go take myself to a Matrix film in the theater. And... um, Yeah, I mean, it was a very similar experience to Reloaded for me. Like, I, there was enough in Revolutions at the time that I, I was able to get on board with sort of like on an emotional level. Like, I I was able to care about the characters we met in Reloaded, like all the Zion people, you know, I care about Z and like, I care about the kid, I guess, mostly because I'd seen the (laughs) Animatrix and that makes me care about the kid, right? As an idea. (laughs) Um, and you know, I care about Niobe and I like those new characters meant enough to me. I was able to care enough about them that the fact that they do most everything in this movie or just like at least half of everything in this movie. And, and, you know, we'll we'll get to that. Um, but they, they really have sort of their own little moments. Everybody has their own little moment and that meant something to me. And so I, I was moved by this and um, moved by the deaths of other characters that I cared about. Like, you know, mm-hmm. this movie kills off Neo and Trinity and Trinity's death is sad for someone who loves Trinity. Like, 
And I, I always have loved Trinity as a character. And so I felt, you know, I had an emotional response to that. So, um, this is, a. Uh, not a good movie and <laughs> i'm what? thrilled like and just very excited to talk about it more with you all and dissect th the ways that i think it just uh, you know stumbles i think is the word for it i think it, it has some stumbles but um if you love the matrix and i did and i do this is also something that doesn't like hurt my feelings like it's not I don't get angry or anything that it's bad. I just am like, this is another part of the matrix. It's another part of the matrix. That's could have been better, I suppose, but it's part of what I have. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Fair. Alex. Yeah. What about you? How are you feeling as a what 15 year old going into this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I, similar to Trisha, I, 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 I didn't, I wasn't feeling, um, I think as disoriented as you were, Michael, coming into this movie because yeah. I was such a super fan. I had played through Enter the Matrix and had studied the like additional hour of footage to mine it for clues about what everything means. And okay, the Oracle is telling Jada Pinkett Smith this in this cutscene about you know why her appearance changed because she made a deal with somebody uh with the merovingian to get a child like what's this child that they're smuggling into the matrix there, there are like all these hints in enter the matrix of like things to come in the next movie so i wasn't even engaging with it as like a normal movie it was more mm. of there's this massive matrix puzzle that's been presented to me through all these this transmedia experiments and i have gobbled up every possible ounce of information from that transmedia landscape and this is like the final piece and so i'm here to get all the final pieces of the puzzle not even to see a movie really um and and yet <laughs> so i went to, into the movie I, I think the trailers felt a little bit strange like there were images in the trailers and there's something a little bit clunkier about the trailers that didn't feel quite as slick as reloaded so i was a little i was a little off put by like just the overall feel of the marketing in comparison to reloaded but I went in expecting, yeah, like Battle of Helm's Deep, you know, Lord of the Rings finale for Zion. That was clearly uh, an expectation that was set up. Um, and I didn't really know what to expect from, you know, the path of the one. You know, what, what's Neo going to do here? Except for, I guess, fight all of the Agent Smiths in the rain. Um, <laughs> and, Which is all and the, the people, movie... by the way. All of them. The right, like, all the people in the, in the Matrix. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then when the movie ended with that final scene like that final scene where we're in this kind of new technicolor uh, matrix version seven or something and it seems to have a population of three as far as we can see which is or like four <laughs> uh just these programs we've met along the way and uh, this little girl and she's like look i made that sunrise like for neo and <laughs> it's like i i believed i believed like it's, I was so the, the disorientation you're talking about, Michael, like I felt that disorientation at the end of this movie where like the final image, the final moments, the final music, everything was so strange. And I just I was like, what was that? What was that? What did that mean? W what happened? Like I was trying to put together this puzzle and the final moments of this movie and, and a lot of pieces of this movie just confounded all of it and didn't add up to anything that I could comprehend and you know i've uh, because i love this franchise so much i have revisited all three movies a lot i've watched them with the uh, philosophers commentary um all three mm. movies the philosophers that they got kind of love the second two movies because everything they're they can point everything as a symbol or a allegory or reference mm. you know to some you know uh, this theory or this uh, philosopher whatever so I, I i was still trying to like in good faith engage with these movies for a long time and try to put the puzzle together and understand like maybe it does all make sense maybe it does all click and i think revolutions more than the other two there are just i just can't forgive it, it, the lack of coherence like there there's just mm. a you know it, it's not enough that this character is named after this thing from this mythology and maybe represents this. I also have to know like why the hell they're in the story and like what they're doing and what it means at the end that they're there. Um, and if that doesn't, if that's not contained in the actual like plot, 
then I don't care that you named this character this or it references this. That's not a story. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I definitely left this movie frustrated because I I was eagerly down to put together a convoluted puzzle. And I feel like this final movie did not give me a satisfying final piece to that puzzle mm-hmm. um, and still yeah. and still fails to do so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. OK. Yeah. And Brian. Um, yeah. You know, I having not been like the biggest Matrix fanboy between the first movie and the second movie, I didn't have like huge, huge expectations for these sequels in general. I think that like when I saw Phantom Menace, I I loved Return of the Jedi growing up, but I didn't was not like a Star Wars like maniac. So I was like, okay, fine. It's a it's a fun sci-fi movie, whatever. But then between Phantom Menace and Revenge of the Sith, I like spent a lot of time with Star Wars. So by the time Revenge of the Sith came out, I was like angry at it for being the movie <laughs> yeah, that it yeah. was. Whereas with Matrix, I was like I didn't have huge expectations. So I didn't feel I, like my feelings weren't hurt by the movies not being better. Um so when I I remember walking out of Theater Revolutions with my friend who I saw with just being like, okay, like sure. They they finished this trilogy and fine. Um and uh but then of course on reflection, like I mentioned last week, you know, Reloaded asked a lot of questions that Revolutions just doesn't bother to answer, like about yeah. Neo and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is just like, no, we're not really concerned with the philosophy and all this question. I was like, that was the one thing I was interested in is is okay, you made me doubt a lot and you brought up a lot of interesting thoughts. What are you gonna do now? Oh, you're gonna shoot robots for two hours, like, great. Um, and, and I mean, th- that's the other thing about this movie is like, it's called The Matrix and we spend so little time in The Matrix. Yeah. Like we are just, we've seen countless movies about man versus machines and that's not what makes this franchise interesting. What makes this franchise interesting is the matrix you know and and we don't get a ton of that in this movie and the stuff we can get into it but the stuff we do get is like it's the lobby scene again but now people can be upside down <laughs> like upside down. we're gonna <laughs> the so greatest annoyed. hits from the first movie <laughs> oh, so annoyed um, with that scene and uh and you know i wonder if like the second movie had spent time in the real world and built up tension for this third this you know finale movie to be like now we're going back to the matrix now we're going to have the chateau and the mm. highway scene and all that kind of stuff but instead it's like it's like you you kind of blew your wad in the second movie and then the third movie is like okay now we just have we're just shooting robots for a while and then we're going to have a sky fight and we're going to you know we've got some some cool matrix action in this movie but just not a ton um so yeah i, I just sort of at the time i was like fine whatever but it's definitely a movie where the more i come back to it the more i find myself just like feeling like it's homework just to watch this third movie to to just to revisit this trilogy yeah yeah (laughs) so so glowing reviews across the board from us (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean Uh. so so there's i think a lot of things to talk about and a lot of lessons to be learned from this movie and one of the things that we've already touched on a little bit here is the the absence of the main characters that we began the story right. with and in the final in, movie yeah and <laughs> yeah. and even in reloaded we don't get a ton of time with any of them or if we are with you know morpheus and trinity and neo it's like walking from here to here to listen to the Merovingian for a while. And then we're going to go down and talk to Persephone, like all the things we talked about in the last episode. But there isn't a ton of like interaction or character dynamics happening with them, even in that movie. And then they're extremely absent in this movie. And like you said, Trisha, there are cool characters. Like I like that Niobe has a bigger role in this. And especially on this rewatch through, I forget his name, but the captain guy who's in charge of defending humanity. Like I'm Ufune. with him most of the time. Ufune, yeah. Of like, you have, yeah, you have an impossible job. You're trying to save humans. And they're like, what about that guy that has a prophecy idea? Have you heard back from the ships that you sent to go yeah. do the thing? And I'm like, yeah, you guys are crazy. Anyway, so... I do have empathy oh, for some of these Locke? new characters. Locke, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Oh. We thought you were talking about like the leader of the mechs, like the actual like on the ground, the like sergeant. Uh, yeah. No, I don't really like him. But wow. Locke this time, I was like, <laughs> no, like you have an actual point here. Like everybody else is crazy. Um. Anyway, I just so- get annoyed by his like monotone. Like he's just so 
always well, in that one register. But but his chin dimple is, is so pretty. It is a pretty chin dimple. Well, right, and and everybody is as you're talking about. We didn't get right. to talk about that in Reloaded, but the like everyone is like monotone and saying things flat and like we have to be cool yeah. constantly and morpheus must also must always have a certain cadence when he says his line because if he says it like this then maybe it's cool right like yeah, he has right. a little pause <laughs> and all the things why well, neo is like so flat through these both these movies you know right it, it, it's because it, in the in the first movie yes he's very reactive but he but he's reacting like he, <laughs> yeah. he he's overwhelmed. He's he's astonished. You know, he, there is emotion and it's it's boring to watch a kind of bored God person for so mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. And and the you know, I've mentioned like the smile test before. I don't know how many times we see anybody smile in any of these movies, but like definitely Trinity and Neo never smile at each other. And we talked about <laughs> the trouble with that love story, but that's even more absent in this one when it finally yeah. reaches its conclusion. And I think so much of this movie suffers from the absence of all these things. Yeah. I mean, I, I just find it to be like a, a structural problem overall. Like I think that when I, I think about the approach to revolutions and reloaded, it's like you're, you're planning two movies and you have a lot of really cool ideas, right? You have like this idea of the Merovingian and his henchmen. You have, you know, like maybe the ideas of the Chateau scene and the freeway chase. And like, you know, I don't actually hate the scene where they like go into the club and they take out all these guys in the lobby who are on the ceiling. Like it's derivative, mm. of course, but like there are cool things about it's it. Fun. Um, yeah. yeah, it's fun. And, and even, you know, some of the stuff with all the Smiths, we talked about that in the last episode. Like, I don't think those are like totally off base ideas. I think they're cool. I do think there is a structural issue though, as you're mentioning, Michael, where like, where do you put all of the like big concluding, like, um, or like climactic fight scenes and, and moments. And they hang so much on the real world stuff in Zion. And I think that just as a general idea, as you're pointing out, Brian, it's like, I want to see stuff in the matrix. I want to be in the matrix most of the time. And so every time I'm in Zion, I'm just like, when am I going back into the matrix? When am I there with Neo? When am I there with Trinity? When am I there with Morpheus? Morpheus is not in the matrix in this movie after that club scene. That is it. Mm -hmm. And that is like at minute, 30 right and there's two and a half hours of movie or whatever it is it's like that's when morpheus leaves the matrix he never goes back in he's just hanging out with niobe in the logos is that where they end up um her ship they end up in the hammer i think actually and and going back to zion and whatever um but it it is this pacing i think but just sort of like overall weight to these two storylines and there seems to be like a misunderstanding of, yeah, what we as the audience are going to care the most about. And they they place equal, if not more weight on Zion. And we do care about that. But when you have this like big humanity story, we are only going to care about our people, right? Mostly. They need to better mm -hmm. tie those things together. And they really, they try like they give us Z and some of these other characters that we ostensibly think, you know, oh, Morpheus or yeah, uh, Link is connected to Z and Neo cares about the kid and <laughs> Naomi cares about Locke, right? Those those connections aren't being made strongly enough for us to get on board with the Zion storyline. And so... I think that the weighting of it, like you got to do one thing or the other. You got to make us really, really care about everybody in Zion or even just like two people in Zion, really. Like just make us really care about a couple of people in Zion. What if Morpheus had been in Zion actually the whole time? Like if you can't put him in the Matrix, put him in Zion, put him in Locke's position, right? What if something happens to Locke and Reloaded? And he gets killed. And then they're like, Morpheus, you're the commander of the army now. 
And we're like, oh, crap, that's a really t- difficult position. We care about Morpheus. We would care about that a lot more. And so I, I think it's just like you got to do one of those things. You got to really connect us to Zion emotionally or you got to stay with the storyline that we care about emotionally. Um, and they just kind of don't do either one of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was what I felt so much uh, this time watching during that second act battle sequence was just like, I these aren't the characters I care about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, could you even just something as simple as like a Star Wars cross cut where it's like, okay, there's no characters I care about that much in, in, in Zion, but like at least we're spending like five minutes over with Neo and Trinity and five minutes with the battle and five minutes with Morpheus and then five minutes with the battle. But instead it's just, they go all in on this like, look at this crazy battle with a bunch of some new, some brand new characters that we only got to meet this movie and some characters we spent one scene with in the last movie. Um, and uh, I, I was thinking like a lot of this movie, even the stuff with the, the, the Trinity, not Trinity, but the Trinity of, <laughs> of our favorite characters, yeah. um, mm-hmm. the triumvirate, I should say, like, it feels like a spinoff, or an episode of a TV mm. show or something where it's like, oh, this week they got to go get this thing from this guy and, you know, and like bring it back to home. Meanwhile, these side characters, they're off in some fight or whatever. But it's like, this is your finale. This is your finale to your <laughs> right. trilogy. I shouldn't yeah. feel like the first half of the movie is just random side questy type content with like either new characters or the characters we care about. I don't really know what their objective is. I don't really know why they need to go and do this thing. And and it's not that they don't make it clear to me. It's just that I don't feel it. If that makes Mm. sense. Yeah. Well, sometimes they don't even know why. (laughs) Right. (laughs) To be fair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's only so many quests you can send these characters on where they're just going after like an abstract idea right you know it's at, at this at some point in this movie the merovingian says bring me the eyes of the oracle <laughs> right right and, and, and it's just like well what does that even mean <laughs> like like they don't they don't do it trinity just pulls her gun out or whatever but like why like what does that even mean uh neo is stuck in like the train station and there's a train man and we have to you know go to the Merovingian to get the train man who works for him to get so then Trinity can ride the train and go hug him. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> he's not compelling. Bribe yeah. the train man with money. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, <laughs> like this watch through blew my mind. I'm like, there's money in like the program side. The program world? Needs like, money. Like, right. yeah. Yeah. My yeah. favorite thing is when he just picks up a suitcase of this like family and pretends to be like a family member. <laughs> Right. He's like I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk on after you as if I'm not like in this weird priest, like just short you know, of whistling. Also, yeah. what do programs pack in their suitcases when they travel? Right. Right. Why do programs have like race and gender and relationships and children? And I just, I'm so confused. I do like that it's Bruce Spence though, um, who. If you've seen the extended cut of Return of the King, is the mouth of right. Sauron, and he's in uh, which one is it? Is it um, Road Warrior, the Mad Max movie with the, where he's yeah. like the yeah, helicopter yeah, yeah. guy or whatever? So you it's know, train man. Bruce Spence always a win, but train station sequence not necessarily. Well, again, returning to structure, what the problem is is that basically the first third of this movie takes place in the Matrix. However, nothing that happens in the Matrix really ends up having any consequence. So, like, there's never any, like, what changes about Neo while he's in that train station? What information does he learn? What choice is he forced to make that changes him, that is going to, like, propel him into the second half of this movie? That's what makes it feel like this really frustrating detour. And the same thing with, like, the Merovingian in the club scene. Like, I like it as an idea. You know, it's harkening back to the opening movie with the club where Trinity meets Neo at a club. And, like, it's a cool idea. Um, But, yeah, the Merovingian tries to use some leverage to, like, change the direction of the movie in the same way that he's able to do in Reloaded. And Trinity is just like, absolutely not. We'll all die right here. And he's like, okay, I guess never mind then. And then they just go get Neo on the train. And that entire no. part of the movie yeah. <laughs> ends up having no consequences. It doesn't feel like it is 
closely connected with a because the way that we talk about like scenes should have a because between them. There isn't a because with what happens next, right? Like then the middle act of the movie, they're on the hammer. I think, um, Captain Roland, my favorite character in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I love he's Captain going Roland. for it. I, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's I like Locke Captain where he's Roland. like, what are you guys talking yeah. about? This is crazy. Yeah. This is stupid. What are you saying? Yeah. I, he's exceedingly reasonable when everyone else is just saying nonsense. Um, but I mean, the whole middle third of the movie, we're on the shit, the logos with Captain Roland, with Neo and Trinity, and everyone's just arguing about what they're going to do next. Um, and like Bane is there and he's acting like Smith. Um, and it takes everyone so long to figure that out. Um, and then, you know, they eventually get onto the logos and they start going to the Machine City. But that first third has absolutely nothing to do like it's i guess they're trying to wake neo up but that's all and what ends up waking neo up isn't that compelling and again doesn't cost anything we often talk about cost right like this the character should sacrifice something they have to make a character revealing choice and then that choice needs to ripple out not just into the plot but into their own personal arc but what we're seeing here is the dividends of the lack of Neo's arc in the previous movie. The previous movie, as we talked about, Neo's arc isn't about anything thematic. So there's nothing really thematic further to be explored. And the consequences of Neo's decision to choose Trinity over humankind are not meaningfully questioned thematically. I wish they were. That's a hell of a choice that he made. I wish it had been right. thematically set up for me. And then I wish this movie meaningfully grappled with what it means that he didn't choose humankind. And I feel like that would be a really interesting middle act of this movie. First, second, third act of this movie. If it were really diving into what does that mean for you as the one that you made that choice? Right. And he never has to make that choice again, even like right. at the end you know, Trinity does die, but like it just kind of happens. It's not because of like a choice he made, really. Like he yes. was trying to save her even that whole time. And so again, like what does that mean? Like he doesn't, like you're saying, make a choice that signals clearly to me any kind of growth or meaning besides like I need to do this thing to fulfill my role as the one, yeah. um, which is obtuse and hard to track anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that real quick, I, I'll say like, I think this movie more than any of the others, uh, anything in this 2003 Matrix world, you know, the game and Reloaded and the Animatrix, this movie more than any other just feels like they wrote a script and just had to get it into production and just didn't yeah. have time to, to really do the things that that they would have maybe otherwise done, like the sort of going through that process of saying, hey, what if the battle happened that what if maybe one of the more important characters was here? You know, the, the thing that I noticed the most is when Morpheus early on, he says, I want to look for Neo in the Matrix. And they're like, what? But he how could he be in the Matrix? He's not jacked in. And then the next scene is the the nurse saying his neural patterns aren't like someone who's in a coma. Yeah. They're like someone who's jacked in. And it's like, yeah, we just got that from the we last thought, scene. You know, it feels like right. they wrote these two scenes and maybe they like one wasn't in the movie and then the other one was and then the other one was. But then they ended up both in the movie and they're just like, well, here's the script. Go start production. You know, it just sort of has that like and again, I don't want to say first draft the way like the Star Wars prequels feel like a first draft, <laughs> but like it still feels like we ideally would have put this, you know, what if this movie came out in 2000, or what if Reloaded came out in 2003 and like Animatrix and Enter the Matrix came out in 2004 and this movie came out in 2005. Like that still seems like lightning fast, but at least then you have a little bit of distance to, to, to sort of focus on one project at a time. And unfortunately it feels like the movie that was supposed to be the big finale, the big closure to this entire franchise was the one that it feels like had the least amount of, of yeah. polish put on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is weird that like Neo gets a Wi Fi upgrade also and he can just get in the Matrix without being plugged in. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's part of yeah, the quest the questions that are raised that aren't satisfyingly answered. You know, it's it's the idea that he can see 
kind of like i guess the spirit of the machines uh like this kind of this like spirit world of golden light that only machines in the machine like city emanates uh mm. but i like what is that supposed to mean like what is what does that say about him or what's happening to him or what he even is none of that's really explored in the text it's just kind of like he now has this new power and he can and it's amazing trinity it's like full of light uh <laughs> think thematically or symbolically it's supposed to mean something but once again what does it mean actually in the story i don't know right and to your point those are cool ideas potentially right like you know the wachowskis have no shortage of cool ideas and i i think that they are you know really brilliant writers and filmmakers and so much like so many cool ideas are jam packed into all three of these movies. And I think that the set pieces in this movie are are not the problem. I think that a lot of them are really cool. Like I love a, the idea of a big battle for Zion and they're in the docks and they've got the mechs and the mechs actually are cool. They they are really cool. Like we've seen them before, but mm. you know, it's it it's an interesting idea that obviously the the humans would need to like harness machine power to fight machines. Like that's, you know, a really interesting juxtaposition and like some of the stuff of like, we have to, there's a machine city and we have to go to the machine city and then we have to meet the wizard of Oz. Um, and he's like, <laughs> he's like gonna, uh, we're, that's how we're going to jack in, right? Like the machines are going to like help us actually jack into the matrix. Cause I can make a deal with the wizard of Oz and he's going to like help me get in there and, and defeat agent Smith. Cause agent Smith is the threat to both of us. And that's how the war is going to end. That's not, like a crazy idea i think on paper it's a really cool idea um mm -hmm. same like the idea of going to the machine city is cool and um all of this stuff like pitting neo against or like against the machines until they agree to like make a deal with him and um that is makes him different than the other ones that have gone before him all of that is cool and the finale idea of like i'm going to uh, let smith assimilate me knowing that I'm like, you know, jacked into the the big machine god and the machine god is then going to be able to kill Smith from the inside if I allow myself to be assimilated. That's a cool idea. It seems like it could mean something thematically. Mm. Like it <laughs> seems like it could be really cool. Um so I just feel like yeah, that's that's I think another part of the the sense of disappointment is that the sparks of really really interesting ideas are all over this this movie and the rest of the films obviously and so it's just like yeah not developed there's a lack of development i think is the issue yeah it's 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 kind of a thing where like afterward when people like would explain to me what happened i'd be like oh that sounds cool i wish i had right. seen that movie like yeah and that's right. what's part of that yeah the the disappointment a little bit and, and like you're saying i like that phrase like the sparks of great ideas are all over the place but they haven't like you know congealed into this singular clear thing mm. yeah i mean by, by the time i get to the final showdown with Smith. It's like, I'm so far removed. Like I just, I'm like I'm not even that invested anymore because you just made me watch like, you know, the battle scene for so long. And I'm like, Oh, right. Neo's in this movie and there's a thing and da da da. And it's like, <laughs> right. it's not even that like, even the execution maybe isn't that, that bad, but it's like you said, Trisha, it's a structural thing where it's like, okay, but then how do you actually feel emotionally at this point? Do you, are you, do you still care? Or are you just kind of waiting for the movie to be over at this point? Mm. Yeah. I mean, and, and just to echo what Trisha was saying, I, as a Matrix super fan, it was exciting to see the above yes. world. It was exciting that they were they're flying over the harvesting fields. They're flying mm. towards this like epic machine city. There's these massive, you know, uh, machine BMF things that are shooting a million bombs at them. Like that's like that is kind of uh, third act cool stuff mm -hmm. that you expect. But then they crash and there's this really awkward, extremely long death scene for Trinity oh, that boy. I want to feel something during, but I literally always zone out and actually don't even know if I ever like watch it actually because it's <laughs> mm -hmm. so long and so almost like uncomfortable for me to watch. <laughs> Because, because you know, poor Keanu Reeves has no eyes. He's trying to cry with like you know no eyes. She's been <laughs> impaled in like three different places through her major organs, and she's just lying there. 
having to say a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and it's just really, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to geek out about all my Matrix super fandom and you keep throwing scenes like this at me and I literally like can't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I remember even in the theater that scene, like once once it was clear, like, oh no, like Trinity's gonna die. Like I did feel that, like that moment right. hit me. But by the end of the scene, <laughs> 20 minutes later, or whatever it is, <laughs> I was like, okay, That's it's time probably... for yeah. you to die. <laughs> like you... it it's like the why is it the it longest is scene ever? Yeah. It feels like the longest scene ever. And like they tr <laughs> like the tr they try. Like it's not the actor's yeah. fault. It's uh, yeah, anyway. Well, I think, you know, just to quickly diagnose the problem with that scene is that they're putting a Band-Aid on underdeveloped romance, right? And so mm, it's like, right. we have, if you'd had a very, very well-developed romance that we were like bought into 100%, here's a very quick shorthand fix. If they have a phrase like, I love you, I know, then they don't need to give a long-winded speech. They can just give a really quick phrase that we understand right. the reference to, right? It's that's just like give them a little language of their own give them a little thing of their own you know um that she can just say really quick right at the death I, I, yeah it could have been something like like she says sex during a rave and he says really good noodles <laughs> and you're like oh right. yeah yeah, yeah. Right. Mm, what a romance that would have done it yeah. yeah yeah like and the thing that i'm suggesting is like the <laughs> most simplistic fix of all time right it's not right. Right. It's not a super complicated fix, but it just goes back to the, the amount of time. Um, you know, if you can't give your attention to each scene as it plays, as an individual scene, and then as it connects to the various arcs, right? When you're plotting out a movie on like a board, which you do, you have to do, especially if you're plotting two movies out, you have like, you know, a large murder board or like really just a <laughs> spreadsheet probably. Mm -hmm. Um but you have to track the beats between of every single relationship. It's like, here's every Morpheus and Neo beat. Here's every Trinity and Neo beat. Here's every Morpheus and Niobe beat. Here's every time we see Locke. And like, da da da. You're, you plot it all out. And then each, every single one of those, you have to give it your full attention. And probably like several days of writing just on that one scene. And then use that to track into this scene track into this scene track into this scene as you're watching watching it unfold on the spreadsheet and when you don't have the time to do that because you have to get all of this stuff out the door it doesn't matter how brilliant you are like stuff falls through the cracks and then you end up writing a scene quickly um and that doesn't end up playing very quickly <laughs> <laughs> well and just, you just mentioned like yeah, where are the Morpheus and Neo beats? Where are the Morpheus yeah. and Trinity beats? Like, right. there, these are three great characters from the original movie. There's so much built-in uh, character drama to mine in these, you know, following movies, especially if there's going to be this uh, disillusionment arc potentially with the one. You know, uh, Morpheus having all of his. Uh, beliefs confirmed by the end of the first movie having them totally ripped away at the end of the second movie morpheus like pinned his whole identity on neo uh neo has like m basically made his actions made sense make sense you know if neo's the one then morpheus isn't crazy morpheus it was it was right to invest all this time and energy into finding the one uh that's a really juicy character story and yeah. like that's a that's a complicated mentor mentee relationship there uh especially if neo disappoints him um and th that disappointment goes beyond just like oh i wish you were a better student it's like oh you just called into question my whole wor worldview yeah um and and how does trinity feel about any of this you know mm -hmm. <laughs> like and uh so yeah i don't know it, it's just it's what a disappointment and what a wasted opportunity you, you have this this triad of characters that could have gone to really interesting places in these two movies based on the disillusionment and maybe the redemption of the one mm. um and it doesn't feel like any of that mattered yeah right yeah yeah very well said something i wanted to mention in in the previous episode was about sort of morpheus's let's say new identity new character traits in the, in reloaded which is one he is just kind of a guy 
uh, and he has this like crazy belief and he gets in trouble from his boss for disobeying a direct order. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but like, also he is this rock star motivational speaker who everyone worships. So it's like, okay. But then also he's in like this love triangle with these two brand new characters. And like, what does that mean? Right. And I don't have a problem with any one of those ideas. And I don't even have a problem with all of those ideas at once, but it sort of felt like the Wachowskis kind of didn't know what to do with Morpheus. We're like, these are all interesting ideas. Let's just do all of them. But then kind of, as you're saying, Alex, like we don't actually even see then where those ideas end up, you know, his right. belief in Neo where no one else believes in him doesn't really resolve in this third movie and the love triangle. It's like, eh, maybe kind of like resolves with like him and Niobe going on an adventure together and like hand Listen, on chest Brian. or whatever. Yeah. Some Sorry. things change and some things don't change, but some things do right. change, some things but do some change. things still never don't change. Love, yeah. love yeah. is just a word. Yeah. Um. yeah, speaking of like simple phrases that are repeated, they did do it there, right. but that's, that's all they did. Right. There was, Not there even was no, no other word spoken besides those words. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, continue. No, no, I mean, that was that was basically it, just as Alex was saying, like there there was room for some of these ideas like they they actually set up they, they laid the groundwork for certain ideas in the second movie and then just didn't bother actually sticking the landing in, in the third movie which is just makes it more frustrating than and again what's why the second third movie feels like this is like a spin-off before we get back to the main story mm -hmm. instead of being like this right. is our finale and it just brings us back to the maxim of you know, complex characters, simple stories. I mean, I think I'm okay with a complex story in the Matrix as well, but I also want complex characters. And, you know, if, if their character drama is so flat, I don't care about all the machinations of the Keymaker and the Merovingian and the Oracle and the programs. I don't really care about those things. I care about how does Morpheus feel about Neo and how does Trinity feel about Morpheus? You know, that like I care more about that than what the Keymaker is at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and the, just that it, it's frustrating that at after all of it, looking back at all the ideas, I once I understood years later, basically what they were trying to go for, <laughs> like it is kind of cool to have a story where Neo is the savior in the end, but he's not the savior of humans. He's the savior of the machines and the mm. computer people and mm. the humans. And so Everybody. like there is a reason to care about these programs because they're going to be saved also like like all these things are in these movies but just like none of the wires are connected such to like tell the audience that this is important and this is how you understand it and this is what you need to be looking forward to with all those things mm. can you imagine if if we had we talked about in the last episode we need a smoother longer on-ramp to this idea of programs that have emotions and are kind of human, very human-like, uh, kind of seeming, seemingly different from the agents, which are almost more one-dimensional besides Smith. Mm -hmm. And you know, if 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 this if these two movies set us up to have like main character machines, basically AIs, you know, we we realize the machine world is way more complex than we thought. You know, mm. they are diverse in their opinions about what to do with humans or whatever we, we we learned that it's not so black and white like there are machines that are pro enslaving humans there are machines that are anti it you know it could have been a really interesting complexity there where neo has both machine and human allies by the end and we want like both to be okay you know at, at the end when neo tells the wizard of oz you know what he wants and what he wants is peace i think there could be a much more meaningful idea mm. of peace if it wasn't just yeah, what I assume he means is like, please stop sending squids to kill people in Zion. Mm -hmm. But if peace meant, hey, I have actually like artificially intelligent allies that I care about as much as people now. Um, I understand that there are machines that are worth saving as well. Like we're, we're, we are all consciousness in different ways. Can we coexist? Then peace like means something like emotional in that yeah. moment. Um that would that would be great. And once again, like, I think these you're pointing out, everybody's pointing out, the seeds of all these things are here. Mm -hmm. like, there seems there seems to be a reason we have, you know, likable program characters in these movies. Uh, it seems to be pointing towards the idea that machines are not this unilateral 
evil force. But yeah, none of the dots are connected. None of the emotional threads are there for me to feel anything when Neo says, I want peace. And I, you know, and when Morbius says he fights for us, you know, I just, what is he fighting for? And, and like, if he's gonna just let Smith assimilate him, why did they have to do the like Man of Steel fight and destroy a city? Yeah, it's a, it's a theme problem. <laughs> Right. It's a theme problem. We talked about it in the first you know, episode on Matrix, um, which is that sci fi is able to literalize thematic ideas. Right. Where it's like, you know, everything in the Matrix is essentially allegorical. It's archetypal. We see how it's connected to our lives. We understand the way that the themes are playing out. We understand that this is an allegory for like, you know, all the all the different things that actually functions an allegory for like you know political allegory there's also like you know a psychological allegory philosophical kind of allegory things that are happening um and you can connect those dots however you want but the the themes are actually there in the text and the character arcs are engaging with those themes and the sci-fi ideas are playing with those themes as well. What does it mean to be an agent of a system? What does it mean that any person connected to that system is also potentially an agent of that system? That is a very clear thematic idea that is being literalized in the text. And the two subsequent sequels, I actually think Reloaded is trying a little bit because there's so much in the matrix and the ideas of like what the matrix is are being developed that I think the allegor allegorical elements are still there or they're still like engaging enough in sort of like a brain teaser kind of way where it's like, yeah, is the, you mentioned in the last episode, Alex, is the one, another measure of control is the mono myth being leveraged for like political or, you know, systematic control kind of reasons. Um, it's a really interesting thematic idea. But a lot of those thematic ideas fall apart in revolutions because the yeah the idea of programs, machines, these things just aren't really being explained. The other issue, of course, and on top of the sort of thematic problem that we have here is a scope problem, right? The scope of this movie is huge. Mm -hmm. It's too big. And so I think that's where we often, you know, run into problems like with the Agent Smith fight. The scope of it is too big. We can't engage with it emotionally because it doesn't mean anything. Like, you're telling me that every person that is still connected to the Matrix is now a Smith? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does that mean in right. terms of scope? What does that mean in terms of theme? Like, right. I need right. I need to know, and I, I, I simply don't. And it's the same thing when you're telling me that there are a quarter of a million people in Zion uh, that's a huge sure. scope issue, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that's too many people um, for me to meaningfully care about, understand like what that is. That's, it's just, yeah, it's just all scope. And, and I think movies th these days, especially sequels run into scope problems quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Um you you can't make you can't make it bigger and bigger and bigger until it encompasses every universe that ever has existed that no longer means anything <laughs> to me a tiny person living on earth in 2021 right yeah well we'll see they're gonna try but no, they really are <laughs> you have problems as big as the scope of quarter million people or whatever and then problems as tiny as a single point by which i mean the pierced ear of both agent smith and neo when did that happen? Uh, <laughs> neither of them has any reason to have their ears pierced, but you've got all the money in the world to make all the CG in the world. You can't just go like, whoop, and <laughs> cover up that. But no, we've got we've got two characters who at some point decided to go get their ears pierced, apparently. <laughs> I've, I've never noticed that, yeah, uh, but that's pretty funny. Well, and also I think a thing that ties into scope in a kind of maybe an inverse or not, intuitive way is the the, the timeline of this yeah. these movies this all happens i believe in 36 hours mm. uh, wild yeah which doesn't make any sense and i never feel that and mm -hmm. so whenever right. they mention 
the amount of time that's passed, it's like a further disconnect instead of like a ticking clock because it's yes. so separate from just like the the amount of things that they do when they go in and out of the matrix and they have to wait for Neo to like sit and think for a while. Then they got like, there's so much happening in that time period that I think having it all play out that quote unquote quickly actually works against what it's trying to do. Yeah. There's a, I think there's also a lack of transitions in these movies. You know, in the first movie, we clearly know when we're going in and out of the Matrix because it's like a big deal to go yeah. into the Matrix. Mm -hmm. They don't go in just willy nilly. It's like, OK, we have to go in for a reason. We're going to see the person get jacked in. We're going to see them now in the Matrix. And I think somewhere in these two movies, I just kind of lose track of what's what and how did they get to here and how much time has passed mm -hmm. and uh, is it a big deal for them to go into the Matrix anymore, or is it just just standard procedure? Um, and and I think there's just a lack of transition shots or establishing shots or just orientation shots that help me just have my bearings at any given moment. Yeah, when you have a problem with scope, you have a problem with stakes, right? So right. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of what you're identifying there, Alex. Which is like, if the scope of this world is so big that we can just that Neo can just go in and out of the Matrix at any point that he wants to, then the stakes of going in and out of the Matrix become really low, right? If the scope of Neo's powers is vast and limitless, then the stakes of the fight scenes become, you know, minuscule, and we don't care about them. So those things are intimately connected for sure. Yeah. Well, and so I, I think we should move toward lessons because like, there's still a lot to, to pull apart that we could talk about in lessons. A thought that popped into my head as you were talking, Trisha, a moment ago about, you know, something that we've, we've talked about a fair amount, actually, is, you know, in the original film, machines and just the world of the Matrix functions as allegory and symbolism. It has all this meaning in these sequels. It has to be literalized. I was... Uh, reminded of uh, Metaclorians in, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, and the Phantom Menace of like suddenly to dive deeper into this, the creator of that movie felt the need to literalize something so that it could be, you know, serve a different function or like we could draw more things out of it. Now there's a story about this kid special because he's got this number of Metaclorians, blah, blah, blah. This isn't a perfect one to one, but uh when Neo goes to see the Oracle in Reloaded, as soon as she acknowledges that she's a program, I feel like there's a little bit of that also, where it's like it's zapped the mm. magic and replaced right. the magic with new world building in order to allow for other things to happen. And it's certainly not as egregious as Metaclorians, but I think it's a similar thing of like, well, you know, trapped in the world that you built for the standalone movie when you have to extrapolate mm. where do you need to you know puncture through some of the things in order to leave room to expand and what gets sacrificed along the way um anyway so that was just a interesting comparison that popped into my head yeah i mean i think it's a, a sequel reboot thing that we run into all the time which is that by necessity movies are stories that are incredibly simplified like and we want and need them to be you need to carve away anything extraneous you need to overly simplify people's emotions people's mm. motivations you need to overly simplify as much as you possibly can to be honest like a, a movie as a piece of media is a bite it's just a little bite-sized kind of thing it's just two hours of your life it's not a TV series. It's not a podcast. It's not a novel. It's not a series of novels. It's just a little bite of a thing. And keeping that like in this little, you know, tiny little hors d'oeuvre cracker that you could just jam in your mouth quickly is something that the first Matrix does perfectly well. And then as you're pointing out, Michael, it's like you're you're trying to create more and more and more and take the pieces of it and make it into something else. And we don't want or need that. And yeah, you end up with this like huge spread of stuff that you never wanted to eat in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to describe this. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to add really quickly that I, I mentioned, you know, reloaded kind of breaks for me in that Oracle scene. And I think part of what breaks is the magic. You know, it's not mm. just that the exposition comes too fast. And I don't know what you mean by programs. 
it's that, oh no, like your scene was so magical in the first movie. It would go to special scene and now it almost feels like it's cheapened and yeah just all the magic is draining out the more you say here because it's now being kind of yeah midichlorined for lack of a better word <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep i will say i like the the oracle in this movie has a line that i never caught before that was a pun but she's explaining kind of explaining why she looks different and she says some bits you lose some bits you keep and it's like, oh, uh, bits, because you're bits, uh, bits. Yeah, uh, ones I and it. zeros. <laughs> I see you, you comedian, you. Also yeah. her red gummy bears. Mm-hmm. Red, mm-hmm. yeah. No, right, yeah. Colors and pills and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so yeah, so let's move into lessons. I'm going to cheat again by asking a question because I kind of want your guys' thoughts Ooh, on okay. a thing, which is... Do battle scenes that are essentially kind of like hold the line scenes, Mm. do they work? And if Mm. so, when do they work? And I think actually studying the battle scenes in this movie is probably really instructive, both on Mm. like what to do and what not to do, because there are moments during the, the very long, you know, Siege of Zion where I am leaning forward and invested. And then there are moments where I'm just like, like skip, like I wish I still had a skip button where I could skip to the next chapter because I don't care. And one of the things that I noticed is the, like when Niobe and Morpheus are like racing to get back to Zion and she's doing her crazy, like driving through the pipes. I really like that sequence. I feel like it's really fun. I feel like all the, you know, the things we like to talk about, there's a clear obstacle and there's a clear goal and there is there is time pressure that you understand. And we know that when they get there, they're going to do a thing that's important. So there's stakes. But kind of in general, there are these scenes, like most of Zion plays, and especially toward the end of like, we just have to keep fighting and surviving until Neo can save us somehow. And I feel like in in battle sequences like that, I tend to disengage. And it reminded me a little bit of like Return of the King too. And like the the Mm. final fight where they're just like, the last thing we can do is go fight them and hope that Frodo does the magic (laughs) that will Mm -hmm. cause the chasm to fall and form around only the bad guys and we'll all be saved. And so I guess I just want to hear your guys' thoughts on that because I think it's, it's something that comes up frequently but i don't know that it works every time and i feel like there's a lesson to be learned somewhere in there so open floor thoughts uh, my just my couple of thoughts that came up while you were saying that um i think when there are clear goals during the battle where there is maybe a hope of uh at least buying a lot of time or or removing the main threat and there's like a way to do it like a scrappy way to do it, I do get engaged. And I think that part of what I like about the battle for Zion is are the drills you know, that have like the legs and, you know, they can fall mm-hmm. over and pick themselves back up. And it's almost like a boss battle in a video game. You're trying to shoot out the legs or, or <laughs> shoot them, right. shoot them in the red area that will blow the whole <laughs> thing up. Um, and that at least, I guess that at least uh, indicates like, hey, if you can get rid of that, that's like the, that's like the end game you know if, if they can't drill any further down then like then we're safe for maybe another 72 hours or whatever um so so that kind of a goal i engage with way more than when it's just here's the mechs shooting infinitely at the infinite squiddies uh because there's not really a goal there besides just keep shooting until you die mm-hmm. um and and I, I i it does become kind of a blur um and there's there's some really cool imagery i really like when uh, there's that one moment where the squids form kind of a, mm-hmm. like a flocking, you know, formation and join together and become this tendril that envelops everything. So fun stuff. But um, yeah, I, I do get very fatigued just watching mechs endlessly shoot at flying things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think Alex is dead on in that you're identifying um, like short term goals and like again scale things um that that keep battles engaging and so like what you're talking about with hold the line scenes michael i think hold the line scenes work 
if we understand why we're holding the line, right? And and that's like a real life battle thing, right? Like you send forward a bunch of people to give the main body of your forces time to retreat um, and get into a more secure location. And that's a real battle thing that happens. Um, and it's a really simple and clear goal. And so it's like, we need to fall back to this position where we can, yeah, buy ourselves more time to like regroup and like put together another, you know, charge or like maybe do a different maneuver. I think that that all works really well. And it's where, you know, real life war battle lessons become cinematic, especially because it's like, it's a perfect cinematic thing where it's like, this is going to cost us something, but we're going to gain something instead. And like, there will be consequences. We're going to lose some of our guys by sending them forward. That kind of a thing in a hold the line scene works really well. Um, When we are holding the line without like clear secondary goals like why are we holding the line what's happening you know behind the scenes and especially if the characters don't have reasonable hopes right like right like what's mm -hmm. what's the end game what's the end game here Yeah, yeah exactly then i think that's where we start to disengage where it just like feels too i guess unrealistic or ungrounded right where like, or pointless almost like sure like, if, yeah. if you're all gonna die no matter what anyway Wave a white flag i don't know that's what yeah. really <laughs> happened in battle mm. right? Like, right if there yeah. really is no hope at this point then then seriously try to wave a white flag um and i guess you know in this case it's like humanity can't do that because they'll all just get instantly killed but um yeah i think that there's you know things like the gate at Helm's Deep is like, oh no, they, mm -hmm. they've reached the gate and that's a major blow. And now we understand like what has to happen here. Um, all of that stuff is overall smart writing. Um, I just think, yeah, you have to have really clear objectives, like chain of causality, understanding of battle mechanics. And that mm -hmm. all takes time. And like, mm -hmm. it's not even just understanding of battle mechanics, but as we talked about, you also have to have characters in each part of the battle that we care about. Right. right. Um, when we were talking about Titanic, yes. We talked about how like there's it's the sinking of the Titanic is masterfully put together almost in a battle like way because the water's coming in. Right. So there mm -hmm. is like a battle element to it where they're trying to outrun or outlast the water to an extent. And it's so well put together because there's a person that we care about in every single place where the water is breaking through. There's something happening right in that exact moment where there's like a major battle happening or like a little piece of the battle. So that's the other piece. We have to know the mechanics, but we also have to have somebody there that we care about. And parts of the Siege of Zion work for that reason and parts of it really do not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my my answer to your question, Michael, is also my lesson, basically, which is just about everything you guys are saying, just focus and stakes. And I hadn't thought about the word scope, Trisha, but like you, that is absolutely part of everything that I'm saying. Um, but, you know, it's just like, remind me what the stakes are and why each thing each each beat is crucial to a achieving that objective and that's for your whole movie but also for you know something like the battle sequence um you know if you look at lord of the rings it's like we understand the entire time like th this thing has to get to this place and if it doesn't then this guy has power over everyone everyone means all of these characters that you actually love because the movie took the time to make you love them and etc um and as i mentioned last week it's okay, maybe all the people in this battle sequence of Helm's Deep are on the front lines, but we are cutting back to Peter Jackson's children who look scared in, <laughs> in this room, you know? And it's like, we understand, we feel that. You know, think about the bathtub scene in What Lies Beneath. It's like Michelle Pfeiffer is basically paralyzed and she, the water is filling up and she just has to turn the thing with her toe or what is she, is she trying to get the stopper out? Or is she trying to stop the, the water? stopper out? The yeah. stopper. Okay. Well, both. Um, At different times. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's like the stakes of that is one person dies, but you feel them so hard, you know, and now even think about nobody dies. The stakes are your dad is going to find your boyfriend in in bed with you or whatever right and then it's like oh he's coming and the door's unlocked and like you got to go hide in the closet it's like that that scene can feel like a battle scene right because <laughs> this because of what you care about and the focus and the stakes and everything meanwhile how many movies are 
the world's going to end and all humanity is going to die. And you're like, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't actually feel those stakes because again, what does that even mean? I think like the for Frodo scene in Return of the King, as you were saying, Michael, like if, you know, obviously some characters we care about would die if they just all died, but like that doesn't, that's the only stakes because then otherwise everything is sort of the same as it was. And I think that this movie, it's like Neo and Trinity and Morpheus are not in this battle sequence, which means if the machines literally come in and wipe out everyone, <laughs> we're kind we of maybe, care. right. Do we <laughs> yeah. care or, you know, and, and think about if you had just spent the, the second movie, just giving us a character, whether it's Lincoln Z or, uh, Cass or the kid, like a character where we we are spending so much time with this person, and and we care so much about them that like we we absolutely need them to win. We don't care about the other quarter million people here. We just want to make sure that this character wins, and we did. We don't have that. We don't have that focus, and we don't have those stakes. Um, there there are maybe fifty random characters in just this movie alone who have like a line. And I don't know who they are or what they want and like anything <laughs> about them. Right. You could have spent yeah. so much time, uh, so much of that time giving me just one or two characters in Zion who I am totally on board with. Easier is take one of the three and put them in Zion, obviously. But like, even if you're not going to do that, just give me a character I really care about. Um and uh, also my other lesson is just if it's the third movie in your trilogy and you put in a character named Bane, who's actually a puppet of the main villain, your 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 movie may not be very good. Uh, <laughs> the end. Uh, huh. uh, yeah. Hmm. Specific things to avoid. Very like, specific. Yeah. Things. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as a follow up to all of this, it occurs to me we actually wrote a video about battles and especially final battles and uh, when they are compelling. Um, we wrote a video about A Few Good Men. Mm -hmm. um, and hmm. A Few Good Men is a dialogue battle, but it, you know, we got to outline a lot of the things that it does really well, which is continually remind us of the stakes, continually remind us, like establish very clearly and remind us of the boundaries of the battleground. Again, the scope is there. And then... What is the theme? What are the ideas that are at the heart of this that are being fought for? And really make us care about those things. And mm -hmm. that's when we care about battles. And you can do that on with between two individuals or you can do that between sides in a war. Um, but we still need to have all of that stuff. So you can always watch the video that we made on A Few Good Men about right. that. Yeah. And, and I'll add on to that. Um that there are like I think Alex, you said a little bit like battle mechanics, right? It's like yeah. is like what are the actual beats of this battle? What is the structure of this battle? Um, I think about something as simple as Avengers, the first one where it's like, oh, they realize, you know, the Chitari can't turn, like they can't bank worth a damn, mm. I think is what Tony says. So he's like, great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like turn quickly around this building, Hawkeye, where you are, and then now you can get a shot because they can't follow me. And it's like, great, that's a thing now we understand about the enemy, that's doing something. You know, as you said, Trisha, Helm's Deep, if they get through this thing, then we're in trouble, but like so far we're okay. Oh no, they got through that thing. What does that mean now? You know, there, there's yeah. just sort of like, what are the actual beats? What is the structure? Uh, and of course, making the, the stakes very clear. Uh, but this movie just feels like there are things coming through the roof. They got in and now they're here. And I guess we just keep fighting. You know, you don't really get right. that sense of, of like, where are we? You feel very um, sort of disoriented through a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like the movie is almost overly successful at telegraphing how overwhelmed the humans are to the point where it's like, well, you're clearly not going to win. So like, and I think that is fine to have yeah. if that, but that's like a beat, like that's a moment. That's not a 20 minute fight scene of like watching people mm -hmm. despair. Yeah. Lose. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I think that was all lots of, lots of good insights in there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Alex, what's your lesson? Uh, what is my lesson? I, I think I do. I want to praise the ambition of the Wachowskis as always, because you know, I, I, you know, my lesson in the negative sense is, you know, these amazing symbols and motifs and allegories and, uh, references don't really matter if your core story is nonsense. Um, but I do want to give 
my admiration for what they have baked into these movies. And you know, there are there are patterns, there are trinities, there are there are, there are sets of threes that you can find throughout these movies. Uh, there are three movies. There's the idea that uh, the first movie is uh, kind of representing birth. Second movie is sex. There's a lot of sex stuff in the second movie. And the last movie is all about death. Um, you've got Zion representing body. You know, it, it's literally features like a long sequence of sweaty bodies grinding. Um, Matrix is the world of the mind, of ideas, of concepts, uh, programs. Um, and it, it, in this third movie, we're, it's revealed that the machine city, the machines themselves are kind of this like spirit world and you know, they're, they're glowing, radiant, golden things. What does that mean? I don't know, but, <laughs> but there, but it's, it's, I do admire, uh, when filmmakers go this extra length to, to kind of bake in, um, these patterns and images and symbols into their movies. And once again, you know, my lesson from the first Matrix uh, film was how successful it was at doing all of that on top of an extremely compelling, extremely exciting, coherent uh, surface story. And I think I think what what's so interesting about studying the sequels is this is what happens when you are still just as committed to baking in these images and these symbols and, you know, building in symmetry, all these things. I, I really, I love when I can look at a, a piece of art, including a, a film series or anything and say, like, oh, wow, there's this kind of macro picture here, this like grand design baked into the whole thing. It's fun to discover that. Um, and so I admire the audacity of attempting to do that. Um, and I, yeah, they just need a lot more time, I think, to do both that and give us the compelling uh, you know, simple story we want below all of that. Um, so just props to the Wachowskis for just aiming high always and going for going for this like really audacious style of filmmaking. I mean, it's it's a very ballsy thing to make these two movies uh, with giant Hollywood studio money. It's yeah. it's really ballsy. For sure. Um, so you got to admire that. Yeah. I mean, if you look at their filmography, like the one thing you can say is they always are just very ambitious, you know, from this yeah. franchise to Speed Racer to Cloud Atlas to Sense8 to Jupiter Ascending. Like they are always trying to do something insane and maybe they don't always pull it off, but you, that is absolutely to be applauded. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. OK. And Trisha, what's your lesson? Take us home. I have a positive lesson as well, and I want to talk about Sati in this movie. Mm. Um, I think she is a really smart addition to this movie. Um, and I think I, I like sort of wish we'd met her and reloaded. Um, I sort of wish we'd like had her and some of the ideas that she represents introduced earlier in reloaded. Um, because she, to me is where the Wachowskis are introducing theme in this movie. And, um, I think she's really fascinating. So obviously she's an echo or like a sort of serving as a reminder of the little boy in the first Matrix movie um, who's reminding us, you know, who is there to tell us there is no spoon. And, um, you know, there's this this idea of like the pliability of like a youthful mind and this sense of sort of like an unpolluted, you know, being is a, a young being, right? And so, like, you know, it is easier for people to be freed from the matrix when they are young, when they are children, because their minds are not so entrenched in the systems of the matrix. They're not so made rigid, you know, by adulthood and some of these things. Um, and so Sati is the child of programs, Um so she's she's in in a sense of you know we have this very human child in the first matrix movie and then this mirror of him in sati who is a very human but a sensibly machine version of him in uh in revolutions and she also is sort of a teacher to neo right in the same way that like the young child in the first matrix movie is a teacher to neo i think there's this sort of purity to that reminder that we, you know, as audience members are invited into the space of like being children um, and like being open-minded about things. And it's a little bit of like a sort of meta 
reminder, but it's always been present in the text of like matrix things um, that we need to free our minds. We need to be open to ideas. We need to be like curious and full of wonder and allow ourselves to change and things like that. And so I really like having Sati in this movie. I think she's lovely. Um, And it is a really, she does a lot of like really smart mechanical things. She makes us hate Smith because when Smith assimilates her, it's like the most heinous thing that you could do, right? If you harm a child in a movie, you're the most evil villain of all time. Um, and so there, there are certain mechanical things that we get from that. But I think that just the con- the fact that she's there at the conclusion with this presence of hope, she's like literally a sunrise. That's the narrative purpose that children serve um, throughout literature. But But even so, it is a nice reminder that the Wachowskis are aware of or or would like us to be aware of this sort of like really pure childlike thing inside of all of us um, that the matrix engages with, right? Like we talked about how there's a little bit of a coming of age thing going on with Neo in the first matrix, right? He's very childlike. And a lot of us were young children on the brink of adulthood when we saw it. And it's purposefully sort of like engaging us with that. Um, I just think it's a really smart idea to put a kid in this and not a kid like the kid that's in Zion, not that kid, like a real kid. (laughs) Um, I think she's lovely. I think she's wonderful. I'm sure we won't see her. Uh, I'm fairly sure we won't see her in Resurrections, but I hope we see a kid. I think that it's a useful reminder that kids are integral to the spirit of the Matrix. Yeah, I I, I feel like it's what you're saying is a perfect example of this is what I love about the Wachowskis and and but when we saw a kid in the matrix it felt smooth it felt like integrated like there there's all these there are all these potential ones here and this one kid kind of stands out to neo uh, and they have a connection and in this movie i just get taken out of it when there's a moment of like here sati go take this like uh matrix cookie dough to my <laughs> uh kung fu bodyguard and ask him Who's if it's an ready angel. yeah and ask Literally him if it's an like angel. ready to bake yet you know like it's just it like that's not like a scene that like means anything to me the way this kid teaching neo about you know reality means something to me uh so that's that's just that's that's part of the disjointed feeling of these movies sure. cool idea cool like i like that there's a kid as well but like what what is she doing here and like what does this even mean what's happening <laughs> We had such a nice ending, you, Alex. Alex. <laughs> Trisha, like, Sorry. serves Sorry. up this beautiful, like, th- yeah. <laughs> I also want to say that, yeah, I, I think what you're saying is really beautiful, Trisha. And what I also love about movies is, mm-hmm. like, like, yeah, you said they make us become like children and put us into this mindset where we're, we are open and out of ourselves for a while. And that is, like, magic. And so it is, yeah. you can definitely feel that love for sure, in these movies and in all of the Wachowskis films. So. Maybe there will be a child in Resurrections. Maybe. Nobody cast is younger than 29, but that doesn't mean that there won't be. Well, we might have grown up Sati. Cast. We don't know. We do have Ooh, grown up Sati. Sati. I love it. Grown up Sati is in Resurrections. Okay. Well, so. Spoilers. I think That's it's time to. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So we're going to forego our what we're watching section so that we can talk about our uh, expectations, uh, briefly talk about our expectations and thoughts going into Resurrections as the next time you hear from us listeners, if you support us on Patreon, will be us talking about Resurrections and dissecting all of our feelings. Uh, for Spotify listeners, there was a Q&A question in the first episode that we did, uh, The Matrix vi- Revisited, where we asked listeners what they were thinking about how they were feeling about resurrections and so Mm. to just like read a couple so like emily says excited dk hype i just hope it has the same relentless energy as the first one sv excited but cautious lex is just there's eight or nine exclamation points Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Froggy Ortiz I get more excited with each passing day Hurricane incredibly skeptical Uh, (laughs) Benjamin hyped as hell Uh, So there's uh, a a big range But it it feels like it's either 
I guess it's not a big range. It's either no, it's mostly hyped, <laughs> right? It's either yeah. super hype or like big cautiousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's interesting. And I feel like that's where my inner soul is, is kind of trapped in a, a, a super position of trying to figure out, am I still a child that is super excited for anything and everything matrix? Or am I cynical adult Michael that is pretty concerned about uh, what the experience will be like. So that's me having seen, you know, just first teaser images and the first trailer. I am trying to figure out if I can allow myself to hope or if I need to be guarded. Um, <laughs> to protect your heart. Yes. Uh, Trisha, what do, what do you think? How are you feeling? I am so hyped. I'm going to love it, I think, um, because... Keep in mind, I'm a person who literally never uh, questioned anything about Reloaded or Revolutions up until like two days ago um, <laughs> and, and have just generally enjoyed them forever. And so like I'm I'm going to like it, although I said that about I said that about the Rise of Skywalker and I was wrong. <laughs> um, but I really think I am going to love this. Uh, I, I don't think I have like big serious expectations for it i think it might be quite dumb and i genuinely don't care like i i truly don't here's the thing i truly don't care what it is as long as it has some cool ass action sequences in it that's really all i care about to me the only way you can mess up a matrix movie is not to put some cool action sequences in it as long as there's some cool action sequences in it, I don't care if they're connected. I don't care what you do with the characters, really. Like, just, like, give me some cool ideas. Like, you don't even really have to deliver a coherent story. That's fine with me. Also, Jonathan Groff. Yes. Give it to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be great. I can't wait. Nice. Okay. Great. Brian, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Um, I think there's there's something nice when you're not like super invested in something like when I remember when Dune was coming out I was just thinking you know what I don't really have I, I haven't read the books I saw the David Lynch movie once or twice 20 years ago so I'm just fine for this to be whatever and I didn't need there to be another Matrix movie so I am I wasn't like oh my god I, I hope it happens I can't wait um, mm -hmm. it was just like okay there were talks about it happening for the longest time and then finally it was happening and now it's coming out and I'm like great you know and, and so my hopes are just i hope it's the second best matrix movie um that would be great and if it is i'll enjoy it um i am very curious about what the actual story is because the, the trailers give away so much except how neo and trinity exist and why morpheus who the only one of the three who survives the third movie doesn't exist or, <laughs> or exists as a different actor and you know um mm -hmm. So, you know, and obviously it's the Matrix, so you can say this is the next incarnation, whatever. Like, there's lots of easy ways to to say why these characters exist. Um, but I, I think that the, you know, the thing that's interesting about CG and action and effects and all this stuff is it only ever is going to look as good as what is possible at that time. Um, so when you watch the burly bra from, from, uh, you know, reloaded, you're like, okay, this doesn't look great, but I also don't care <laughs> like about what the story is. But if you watch the matrix, it's like, first of all, it looks good, but even if it didn't, you're still just so invested in it, you know? So I'm hoping, um, th there's already lots of cool action that is in the trailer, but I'm just hoping I care. I'm hoping I care about what the story is. I care about the characters. I care about what they want. Once you do that, then the then the the action scenes are great. But we can anybody can do anything in a movie these days, which wasn't the case in 1999. So so you can't just say, look, we have some people doing backflips and people walking sideways and stuff. Um, like it, you have to actually make me care and be invested in what's going on. Um, and, and then I will love your action scene. I will I will absolutely love the hell out of an action scene. But I have I need to be caring about the story first so ultimately i hope i care about the story i hope i think that the that the story itself is well written and well executed then on top of that any matrix the action stuff we get is just all going to be icing on the cake mm. nice cool. i honestly would be happy if it's the third best matrix movie mm -hmm. right yeah <laughs> just not the worst as long as it's not the worst the second best. <laughs> right. just yeah. the third best would be nice yeah i will say 
as I, as you were speaking, Brian, I was thinking about it and like the little bits that we've seen of the trailer of like Trinity and Neo, like meet cuting in the bank or whatever. Uh-huh. I already feel like there's a stronger love story happening just mm-hmm. in those right. shots. Yeah. Yeah. The, the chemistry match. feels more it. real. Yeah. Right. Really. Like they smile like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the one thing I'm glad about the trailer is that whether the trailer is the first 10 minutes of the movie or the first half of the movie, who knows? But it's like, this is a focused story about Neo and about Trinity. And even if it's sort of a reboot, like we're just greatest, you know, we're Force awakens the first, uh, you know, the first right. trilogy, like, look, he's waking up, he's learning about the Matrix, and, you know, Morpheus is teaching him in the dojo. It's like, wait, yeah, we kind of have already seen this. I'm just glad that they are at least selling me on a focused story about a couple of characters and not about, remember the yeah. last battle yep. sequence? This one's getting bigger. You know, it's it's absolutely totally. not, at least in the marketing, not that kind of movie. Yeah, nice. yeah. a little bit of that, like, reset button, which, mm-hmm. yeah, I do think Force Awakens benefited from for sure so that's a good example cool okay and alex how are you feeling i'm feeling i'm feeling great you know because i i i also never needed this movie to exist and now it exists and i'm just excited to see what it is and i uh you know as far as the trailers go um the thing that has gotten me excited about this movie you know, even some of the action shots in the trailers look actually a little bit awkward to me. You know, some of the shots look really cool and some of the shots feel more like latter day Wachowski way of shooting things, which is a little sloppier. It doesn't have that Bill Pope, like, you know, first matrix perfection in, in the, in like just the look of things. Um, Bill Pope, the DP of the originals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bill Pope is the original DP. Um, but I'm also okay with latter, you know, like Lana Wachowski is a different filmmaker than she was 20 years ago. And, and there's a looser style to the latter day Wachowski filmmaking. And as long as that can be, you know, imported into the matrix world and not feel out of place there, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, the thing that I'm excited about actually is the fact that it does seem like it takes place mostly in the matrix. And it does mm-hmm. seem like it's returning to a lot of the things that made the first movie so much fun, which is the mystery and the unfolding of, you know, like mind blowing revelations and what's actually happening and how is this possible? It seems like this movie is returning to that territory. And I think uh, like you can make just an okay movie in that territory and it's going to be like high up on my list of like movies that I like because I like those kinds of movies, you know, so um. Uh, yeah, it seems like in general, from what I can tell from the trailers I've watched, I've avoided the most recent, like the final trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, but from what I've seen, it just looks like it's in a territory that I'm just really f- excited to visit. Um, so once again, if, if it's cheesy, if it's whatever, I don't care. It's the Wachowskis. I expect cheesy. I expect goofy. Um, let's just have some fun in the Matrix. And yeah. let's let's go back to like this these classic feelings of waking up in the Matrix and finding out your reality is not real. Like, let's do it again. Same. Sounds great. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I remember almost immediately after Revolutions came out, people were like, oh, God, I hope they like never make any more in this series. Mm. And I was like, no. Like, make as many as you yeah, can. Yeah, do it, yeah. Because, like, I don't think you can make it worse. And, like, I want to <laughs> go back to this place. So, like, yeah, let's just keep turning them out. I think that's fine. That'll be fun. And so it, it is cool that here we are 20 years later, uh, but that that is what's happening. So there is a part of me that is very glad it exists. And we'll, I will be there opening night. And it'll and the green will happen and the sound will be in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for the theater. Ah. Yes. Yes. Uh okay, great. Well, I, I think that's a good read on how how we're feeling. Um <laughs> I hope you guys are excited listening also, because we're we're gonna talk all about it as soon as we've seen it. It's gonna be it's been a while since we've done like a hot take new release episode and mm-hmm. they're they're always really fun. So uh yes, hopefully a week from now if all goes according to plan, that will be dropping. Uh so sign up on Patreon to make sure that you don't miss that patron exclusive episode. This has been our conversation about the Matrix trilogy. Uh, Thank you to all the patrons for supporting the show, making it possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cairos. Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi. And we will see you in the Matrix Resurrections. 
Also Die Hard next week. <laughs> but also The Matrix Resurrection. Also Die Hard. Um, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. <laughs> bye.